Daniel Campo is the author of The Accidental Playground, Brooklyn Waterfront Narratives of the Undesigned and Unplanned, which the New York Times recommended as one of the 10 books that mayor-elect Bill de Blasio needed to read before he took office in January of 2014. Dan's current research explores grassroots efforts to preserve, reuse, and enjoy iconic but decaying industrial complexes across the North American Rust Belt. He holds a PhD in city planning from the University of Pennsylvania and was previously a planner for the New York City Department of City Planning. Dan and I work together at Morgan State University where he is the program director of the Graduate City and Regional Planning Program. Please help me welcome my colleague and good friend, Dan Campo. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I want to thank Suzanne and, and Kathleen Lane and Kelly Sovich, uh, Kel, uh, Randy Sovich and Kelly Dans and everybody at AI, AIA Baltimore for inviting me and for uh, putting together such an imaginative program. It's uh, really a, a wonderful forum, and I know that the, the comp I'm looking forward to the competition and uh, publication parts of it as well. Um, my research is, what I do uh, as a researcher is I try to look at stuff that falls in the cracks, stuff that it's not planning, it's not architecture, it's not landscape architecture, it's something else, it's undesigned, it's unplanned, it's anarchic, it's residual, it's marginal, but somehow there's a, there's a real urban value to these places. And what I try to do when I'm looking at these places is I try to bridge the gap so make these places, uh, bring professional architecture and uh, urban planning closer to these places and bring these places closer to the professions. And that's what I'm gonna show you today in, the, in a waterfront context. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story about a waterfront and this waterfront's in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And uh, this is an interesting opportunity for me. I've never actually presented, I've presented this project a lot. This is the subject of my book, The Accidental Playground, and I do believe there's copies if you'd like to purchase one uh, after the lecture. But um, the, the pairing with Barbara Wilkes is fantastic because she actually designed a piece of this waterfront after, I, after this period that I'm going to show you what it looks like. And this waterfront's in uh, North Brooklyn. It is, let me see if I can pointer on the, it's right here, right? And it's, it's a lot like a lot of waterfronts in Baltimore. This decaying post-industrial industry has left, people have moved to the suburbs, lots of decaying piers. And uh, this is what that waterfront uh, looked like or how it was mapped in the 1920s, kind of at its uh, not its apex, but its immediate post-apex. And you can see the dense network of rail, rail tracks that uh, lead into the neighborhoods, um, factories and warehouses and refineries. Um, and this is how the rest of the United States communicated its goods to Brooklyn, Queens, and Long Island, right? So you see that here. Here's, that, here's the site. It's right there. And um, this is... It was part of something called the New York's Water Belt Line. Hundreds of railroad piers and, uh, and uh, barges and so on. And this is what that site looked like uh, at the bicentennial. It was still quite active. Uh, lots of industry had gone away, but there was enough business and there was a need for this rail connection to, uh, for goods to come to and from New Jersey and other places. And, uh, the business was good enough that it, it could have continued, but in uh, 1983 there was a consolidation of the various waterfront railroad companies uh, in New York City, and this one got bought out, it was closed down, and uh, by 1983 there was also a mixed-use development scheme uh, for this 24-plus acre site. 
Well, that particular mixed-use development scheme uh, ran into the recession of 1987, and uh, the the developer couldn't get the finance they needed to make that happen. Eventually, the bank that held the mortgage would foreclose on that property, but it would take about 15 years. But um, the site wasn't actually vacant. There was actually, if you look in the foreground of this site, you'll see some warehouses. And just beyond those warehouses, behind, in front of that uh, Cass Gilbert um, Austin Nichols warehouse, uh, there was an active garbage a transfer station in a scrapyard. And that scrapyard was, um, it was kind of disgusting. And it kept growing and growing, and the operator never had a, a permit to actually run it. What he did have was an agreement with the mayor of New York City and the police commissioner. And um, uh, so the Garbage was sorted there and put on trucks, and trucks were rumbling through the neighborhood and so on. Anyway, it was bad enough, and people spoke out against it. Um, but then a, the, the mayor, who hated, absolutely hated this part of Brooklyn Community District 1, and uh, he, he was in, intent, and I worked for the, the planning department at this time, intent on punishing this part of uh, the, the city. So he imagined that this was the cure to New York's garbage woes, and he was closing the Fresh Kills landfill at this time. This is around 1995, 96. He said, okay, well, I can bring all those gar that garbage to Brooklyn where it will be sorted and put on trucks or barges and sent somewhere else to out-of-state uh, landfills. But again, there was never an actual permit to run this big facility. There was a lot of community activism area in this area, and eventually the good guys did win. Very complicated story, and some of it depended on kind of circumstance. It wasn't all activism. Uh, it's in the book if you want to read more about it. Anyway, New York State eventually took title to this property. They had worked with the Trust for Public Land, and uh, the problem was New York State didn't have uh, barely had enough money to purchase the site and had no money to, to build the park. And in fact, um, the, while New York State and the Trust for Public Land were trying to buy this site, uh, speculators beat them to the punch, bought it out of auction for about five, this, uh, half of the site for about $5 million, um, and four large waterfront blocks. And then uh, New York State had to deal with the speculator. Um, the speculator sold a half of the pro less than half of the properties in New York State a year later for eight and a half million dollars, uh, holding the other two properties, the other two blocks, for eventual massive cash. One of those blocks was sold in uh, 2011 for 94 million dollars. Right, so um, New York State wasn't very nimble, and, and they got beaten to the punch. But they did try to do the right thing, um, and there, there's the state director saying, "This is where everything is going to be," you know. Um, so they had no money, uh, but the Trust for Public Land said, hey, let's, we're going to pair you with uh, NYU, and NYU will build its competition sports fields there, and, you know, the community will be able to use it, and it'll be a partnership, and everyone will be happy. So uh, three years of meetings and charrettes produced this uh, design. You can see this, the site is actually a lot smaller than it should be, right? The, the blocks that the speculators got a hold of. This is where uh, Barbara's Park's, Park is right here. Um, and uh, the, it wasn't really a happy marriage, and uh, NYU eventually pulled out of it. It didn't really work for the, the community activist either. And then the, the state was kind of left like, well, what do we do now, right? They had no money to to build the park. This is around uh, 2003, 2004. Uh, but good news, the New York, New York City is applying, you know, is the, in the bid process to get the Olympic Games. And if New York gets the Olympics, then we're gonna make a swim center here and the archery center and it's gonna be so big and great. So nothing happened on this site for a few years while we waited to hear if New York would get the Olympics. They didn't and the state was back to square one. 
eventually they, they knew I was studying the, the site and they did call me at the University of Pennsylvania and asked me what I, I thought they should do with the site and I had some, some uh, advice for them. I didn't think they'd actually listen to it. But they actually did, or they were thinking of it themselves. And uh, they did a kind of in-place park, you know, just smooth out the rough edges and uh, let's open this thing, right? And of course, it took them to 2007 to do it, a lot of missteps. And uh, there's the ribbon cutting. And there's the park in 2008. Um, it's a kind of an interesting landscape, right? You have these big sloping platforms that used to have warehouses, all the green was where there used to be railroad tracks. And um, the other uh, salient and interesting feature is this informal beach that you'll see in, in future slides. But it was a, a kind of a bitter pill for everyone who lived in the neighborhood because the, the neighborhood is changing from all these noxious garbage-related uses and chemicals to gentrification, right? And uh, when Mayor Bloomberg came onto the scene, he said, oh, this is a great waterfront. All this space with this beautiful view of Manhattan, let's rezone it all. So 170, 180 block rezoning for mostly high density residential. And you can see the first of those buildings going that's just been completed, part of the, the edge condominiums there on the, on the left, on the right side of the screen. But the park was popular, and um, more and more people came out, and uh, uh, a lot of the locals who had been involved in uh, activism were complaining, oh, you know, why are there so many corporate events? Why are all these hipsters here uh, at this park? This is what we had fought for, um, including the, uh, the Brooklyn Flea, and some of you probably are familiar with the Brooklyn Flea. Um, and, you know, we, we could stop the story here and it'd be an interesting, provocative one. It's, this is the, a historic waterfront. This is a, a reclaimed waterfront. This is the people's waterfront. This is a, a polluted waterfront. Um, this is a gentrified waterfront, a, a, a waterfront that's been rebuilt with global money. There's all kinds of issues that we can uh, discuss. But some of these narratives, this sort of meta-narrative misses a lot of other parts to this story, and that's what I set out to tell. There's another waterfront in the same site, and it's the waterfront where men from the neighborhood, people who used to work on these sites uh, when they were active in the 60s and 70s, gathered every day to, to enjoy life, to be near the water, to play music, to drink a beer, and um, even in these men here, they're the working class, the Irish, the Polish, Italian, and Puerto Rican uh, men of the neighborhood, they've made a little uh, space for themselves here amid some garbage dumpsters. Uh, while, while, this while they're hanging out in this space, there's still an active garbage carting facility just a, a half a block uh, to the south of where they're sit standing, sitting. This is uh, taken in 2000. And this is 2012. This photo is taken from exactly the same spot. And if I tried to get this photo today, I would be taking a picture of the, the newest condominium, the edge of the newest condominium that's there uh, rising in front of what, what's the edge, now has another condominium in front of it. So there's, there's a kind of evolution from this, from industrial to uh, a kind of post-industrial to a a revived waterfront, and now that revived waterfront is, is growing and changing too. But this story, the story of the undesigned, the unplanned, the anarchic, uh, needs to be told, and we need to understand it, because it was an environment that brought much happiness to many people. And uh, it was a landscape that many found compelling, and many t even today find the kinds of things that they find in water, the New York's many and fine waterfront parks, that those, those parks are missing some of the dynamic of this waterfront, so let's understand it a little bit, right? And when I was first looking at it, I said, people said, well, what are you looking at? And I said, I'm looking at the place where people go to make their own environment, right? This is a place where there's no design, you make your own environment. Later, I would call it appropriation, transgression, right? Later, after I finished the book, someone said, this is autonomous spaces, and I kind of, I kind of like that. Right, you make your own environment there. And of course, the water itself was a very important part of this uh, environment. And uh, you can see in this image 
that the the Clean Water Act and deindustrialization has brought a lot of fruit to New York City, right? The water quality is going is getting so much better that all these microorganisms are eating away at the the wood pilings and the the wood cribbing that underlies these probably 19th century piers, right? So the, the piers are collapsing over time, and that in itself is kind of an interesting thing to look at and to experience and to um, to be on top of. Uh, and uh, it's a great spot to catch crabs, a great spot to fish, and, and lots of people will do it. You can see in the background of this picture that of all of the garbage containers that are there. Those are, those are garbage containers that are so beat up that they have themselves have become garbage. And um, it wasn't just the water. Of course, the water was a, a big part of it. And it wasn't just the views. People went to this site to experience those things that are hard to experience in the middle of Manhattan or even in the middle of Brooklyn, right? To, be, to feel the, the sun, to feel the wind, to touch the ground, right? The elemental, right? This was important, even on a very, very cold day. This is like the first week in March in 2001, right? People were out there. Uh, just to feel that, have that experience of the sun. And because this site was facing west, it was like a, you know, it was like can't miss sight to, uh, to see the sunset come down over Manhattan. And lots of people did it. It became a kind of ritual on weekends and even during the week. And people brought friends from out of town. And tourists had kind of stumbled upon the site as well. And people would celebrate this moment that we often forget that all people experience every day. People also went to this site to escape, to get away from stuff, to get in touch with their feelings or their problems, a kind of Thoreau walk in the park, right? This was what, you know, this is a dense, deindustrialized Brooklyn, right? There is no woods, but there is these sites, and, and people went there to kind of be away from the distractions of life so they could kind of get in touch with themselves. Lots of people did this, all different kinds of people from, not even just from the immediate area, from all over New York City, made their own environment. People have taken a bike ride across the bridge from Manhattan. They saw something, they say, hey, what's going on down there? Let's see what's going on. And they wound up as on the site. Another thing that you can't find in uh, too many New York City parks is the ability to make your own stuff, right? Where, do you, where can you make your own swing set? You can't do it, and you're not supposed to do it in Central Park or Prospect Park, and you certainly can't do it on the High Line. But this was a place where you could do that. Of course, it was a good spot for alfresco picnics and a great spot for dogs. Um, Dogs turn out to be a really important part of the story because the dog walkers were out there every day, right? Even before, I mean, the, the thing is, is New York is changing during the 90s and 2000s. It's getting safer. More people are moving back to these neighborhoods, more professionals, more artists, the whole, whole gamut. We won't entirely unpack that. But this waterfront all of a sudden that seemed so forbidding where there were chop shops and prostitution rings, there was on this site, um, IV drug use, all kinds of you know, menacing and illegal acts is now this place where people are walking dogs, but the, the dog walkers are kind of beacon, right? They're, they're the eyes and ears, right? They're, there's a kind of Jane Jacobs-esque experience here. And people see these dog walkers and they say, hey, it must be, it must be pretty safe. There's, there's people walking their dogs there. There's people fishing at this site. I think I'll go check it out. Of course, the dogs can get into the water. They can be off the leash, right? And the dog owners of New York, oh my God, it's terrible. You have to keep your dog on the leash until 8 p.m. and then only in these spots, right? Well, the dogs ran free here and broken glass be damned, right? And uh, so, you know, this was the rare New York City site, and even today, the, one of the few sites that faces New York, faces Manhattan, where you can actually touch the water, get into the water, skip rocks. And uh, lots of people did. I even met people who swam between the piers, right? Getting, this is something really important, touching the water, being able to make that elemental contact. Of course, um, there were some, and I, I have different chapters in the book based on these different you know, kind of creative constituencies and um, their, their constructive acts, right? Uh, the, the skateboarders, there's a lot to unpack and we can't unpack it all, but um, the, a lot of skaters in the, in the neighborhood 
where are we gonna skate, right? The neighborhood's changing, there's too many shiny SUVs. I work, I work ethnographically in part, so I, I did a lot of interviews, right? And um, they said, hey, well, let's go to the waterfront, right? With the temporary jumps, they put them there, and all of a sudden it was like the can't miss place to skateboard. One of the skateboarders, an older skateboarder, said, you know, I, I got this vision. It's kind of like close encounters of the third kind. It's a, it's a mountain, it's a, it's a volcano. Um, and uh, let's, let's build it. And uh, so the, well, they got a whole bunch of kids from the neighborhood to pile up rocks and pieces of concrete and debris and wood, and they made a big pile. They went to Home Depot, they pooled their money. They got concrete mix, they got buckets, they, they're filling, they're bringing the buckets to the river's edge, they're filling it with river water, they're stirring it, they're kind of using their hands and whatever they could find to make this, this mount, this uh, jump. No experience with concrete, no experience in design, no experience in construction, but wouldn't you know it, what they can completed was a kind of unique, this is what they told me anyway, never before skateboard jump. And uh, sure enough, it was like, not only people from all over the New York area, but uh, the, the skateboard company, apparel companies were flying professionals out from California to, to do sh photo shoots and so on. The, the site was also appropriated for model shoots, like nothing to do with skateboarding, just models on you know, photographs, anyway. And uh, so uh, based on the success of this one, there was another jump built and um, they learned, right? So on the second go around, uh, they used a, a kind of improvised rebar to make it stronger. They, they cut it, they got power tools, right? They used power tools for this one. They got a concrete company to dump, to sell them the slag. So they had a, a kind of motorized trough and they, they did it all in one afternoon and um, with power tools and, you know, uh, they, they were getting better. There's a kind of incremental, iterative design build process here, right? And um, they also got more skaters involved, so the cost of actually paying for this was less. Here's what it looks like when it was done, right? It was a, a difficult jump, but somehow, as they described to me, that their design, done by necessity, it was a lot safer than actual skate parks because they were building up not down, and the uh, skaters had to kind of, the, the, these kind of mean looking uh, jumps were actually safe for uh, little kids as well because they could kind of go up only so far in their own strength before they'd have to kind of turn around. So this was a kind of skate park for everyone. Anyway, the skate park didn't last that long. New York State actually demolished it uh, not long after it had reached its apex in August 2001. Um, and uh, that's a story we, we can, you can read about it in the book. Um, but all those afternoons when the skateboards were out there on that same piece of concrete, that thing that everyone called the slab, was where the Hungry March Band practiced. Every Sunday afternoon from about 1998 to 2004, every Sunday afternoon they practiced and um, you know, they're New York City's punk rock marching band before marching bands were cool. Um, you know, part of it was the Hungry March Band. They made it cool, the punk rock marching band. And uh, every, every Sunday they had a kind of interesting routine. They'd roll in into practice, they'd roll out of practice, and um, you know, they would they'd barbecue, they'd hang out, they'd, one had a kid, the kid was kicking the soccer ball with the homeless guys that are there, you know, it was all, all kinds of stuff was happening, and it was a different users were, you know, there, there was, the sum of all these uses was greater than the parts. But you know, people would hear the band play from pretty far away, right? This is an ideal place. There wasn't any housing or anything, and the band could play as loud as they want for as long as they want. It didn't cost them anything, right? And so they, you know, they, they also became a beacon, and then they became such a regular institution that they provide the soundtrack of the waterfront. And people came out on Sundays and said, hey, I, I'm coming out because I, I know the band's there. I want to hear the band, right? Some people would dance while the band played, right? So they were just practicing, but their practice created a kind of impromptu concert for everybody else. After or several hours after the band packed up, uh, the fire spinners came out, right? Where were the, 
you know, Burning Man, right? Where are we going to practice? And the, they, they did it for only a few years on the site, um, but there were uh, burners from all over the metropolitan area. In addition to these kinds of performing arts, there was also a lot of visual art, installation art, um, found object art, and so on. This was a dynamite site for art, and I, I was lucky to document just a small fraction of what, was, what happened there from 1983 to 2007. Um, you know, the interesting thing is, you know, New York is like, it's so competitive, and every square foot is fought upon, and where, where can you do art if you're not part of an MFA program? Where can you do art if you're not sponsored by a gallery, right? Where can you go do art if you, you don't even have any training, right? Well, this was this place, and there was a lot of materials that you could use. The wooden balls, okay. Um, 25, right, okay. The wooden balls is a whole accidental art, right? No one knew where those balls came from, but it didn't matter. Some people made shapes out of them, moved them around. Some people smashed them against the side of the wall, and some people tried to walk on top of them. And then over the course of a summer, they kind of all dissipated. They wound up in hidden spots, and then they were gone. So there's a life cycle, right? Um, this was also the site where uh, people watched the, the trade centers burn. On, uh, hundreds of people came to the site to watch that awful event on 9-11. And uh, there was a whole shrine along the waterfront. And um, about six months after 9-11, um, somebody put up this uh, anonymous artist, put up this sort of scale bar replica in kind of cardinal orientation to the actual um, trade centers. You would have seen it kind of popping up above that shaft. That's the shaft for the L train right, right behind there. Lots of photo shoots, lots of uh, student films, Hurricane Streets, uh, uh, Laws of Gravity, some feature films were filmed there. Some more involved arts, and I talked about this in, uh, in the book. This one was a kind of reclaiming of the waterfront. The sculptor who had grown up in the area, a Manhattan sculptor, said, I thought this site could use a little love, you know? He wanted to mark that which was not land and that was which was not water. So he had a, an environmental theme. Can, can the water, can this land be reclaimed and how can it be used? And his, this, the sprinkler sculpture was all stuff that he had salvaged from the Manhattan dumpster. So it's all dumpster stuff that had been thrown out and he assembled it there with the help of impromptu volunteers. While some were exploring uh, reclamation, others were exploring wildness. This artist named Ur, you can see Ur here, it was a starving artist from France, never had any documentation to be in the country, and eventually in 2004 he did leave. Um, but while he was in Brooklyn, he was a kind of polymath, and he could master any art if you gave him a week. Got a job in a metal shop, spent a week collecting metal parts from the waterfront, brought them to the shop, welded them together at night, and in a week of sleepless nights had created this. There he goes, the, the um, sword for the top of the pirate. Pirate was used in a local opera that he uh, played in. He plays the saxophone, and he also um, wrote the opera with his friends from Pennsylvania. And um, then when the opera was over, they wheeled the sculpture up Bedford Avenue on a dolly while they played music, and eventually he said, you know, you know, they were bringing it back to the waterfront. He said, I was offered money for this, but I wanted to return it to the people. You know, this is where this sculpture was born. Right. There it is, the vanquished pirate holding its sword to Manhattan. Of course, the freedom to create is also the freedom to destroy. And um, when I interviewed this artist, he, he was, when he was talking about the destruction of his own work, he got really excited. He said, it was an act of rebellion. I saw the kids kick the head into the river. It was a real act of rebellion. You know? So you know, there's a kind of uh, lesson here that we don't necessarily have to think about every, the whole you know, forever. It's too long, right? That things can evolve and then devolve. Of course, the, those guys, a lot of them were Vietnam vets. A lot of them were working class guys. They, this is, was, you know, they didn't feel comfortable. The neighborhood was changing. This is where they could kind of do that stuff that you weren't allowed to do in parks, the barbecue, the beer drinking, smoking pot, so on. 
There's also homeless guys living on the site. They were, um, they actually shouldn't be, I, I apologize, they shouldn't be defined by their, their uh, housing status. They were itinerant laborers. Many of them were for Latin America, uh, from Mexico and other places. And uh, there was a lot of construction on the, in this area in the early, late 90s and early 2000s, and they had nowhere to live. So they lived communally on this waterfront site. Some had some interesting social problems. Uh, it, it's a very complicated, their lives are very complicated, and I don't want to simplify them. Um, but they lived communally as all this People's Park stuff was happening. And, you know, the, it was an interesting thing, and I, I talked to them and spent a lot of time with them, and, and they, so what are you going to do when it gets cold, right? Are you going to go to the shelter? Um, but they, they lived a kind of joyous and joyful life, even though they had so little, right? They, that this, this site gave them the ability to have some kind of autonomy with when they ate, what they did. They didn't have to rush off to the shelter, right? And then they, they interacted with everyone else. So there's a lot going on here, and some of this is a kind of, all of these stories have this kind of yin and yang, this dialectic, um, Part of what makes this place good is also what makes New York good. The high and the low, the near and the far, the crowded, the completely desolate, right? This, this play of contrast. And today the site's really well used and this sort of makeshift um, design, if you could call it that, the undesigned de design that the Parks Department is, the State Parks Department has pursued is actually quite popular. It's still one of the few places where you can actually touch the water, even though the, this riprap is a little foreboding. Uh, it, they need to do that to stabilize it. Uh, it's kind of being loved to death. This was just a two weeks ago. And um, it's, yeah, the first warm day of spring, right? Everyone is out. Right, so it, it's it's a, an interesting and successful park, but you know it's also the land of no, no fires, no dogs, no fishing, no loud music, no beer drinking, no skateboarding. Right, all of the stuff that I showed you, most of it you can't do. Right, so there's there's a trade-off as we move these things from the undesigned to the design. Here's the Esplanade, um, and Barbara's Park is just kind of around the corner. I, I didn't want to take a picture of Barbara's Park, and you know if it wasn't good, you know, I, I would feel bad um, that the picture wasn't good. But, um, the, you know, I understand. I work for the city planning department. I understand New York has real needs. It has needs for housing. It has needs for the ferry service is quite popular, right? Needs for safe outdoor space, right? But this is the safe waterfront. The, the contradiction is gone, right? This is something else now. Around that same time, I got involved as quickly in a public art project uh, as, the, as the book, you know, as, as this experience was sunsetting uh, on another site uh, just to the north in uh, Queens in Hunter's Point. And uh, we, we did a whole bunch of guerrilla art projects. And uh, th this particular um, project we called Unguided Tour. And in, in part, I was leading this or guiding people to this waterfront site. And we were trying to re get people like, rewilded, you know, we're trying to get them, uh, reconnect them with the wild, and that's what this site was. It wasn't necessarily native, but it was definitely wild, right? So the experience of brushing up against the, the prickers and the uneven ground and the wind and the sounds, like all of this, trying to bring urbanites back to this elemental experience. And uh, one of the interesting uh, projects was the epoch, the uh, next epoch seed library, right? All of, uh, one of the artists collected all of the seeds from all of these plants and has created this incredible seed library of all these vacant lots all over New York City and other places, right? Like, these are the seeds that survive in the 21st century. These are the pl things that will grow no matter what. We should, we should collect them, study them, and understand them. Poetry readings, citizen science, citizen archeology, span um, uh, pirate radio, listening party, is fantastic infrastructure on the site. Um, and I posited in a paper that the, this site had a, a few different qualities that were, you know, were, that all these sites had this kind of elementality, wildness, duality, and pliability, right? And, and I think uh, landscape architects 
do a lot of these things well, but we don't always get the wildness right, and, and the pliability part is missing, and it's not re really a fault of landscape architects per se. It's it's a kind of collective fault that we can't go to parks and like dig and build and create, right? This is stuff that people do in their backyards and in suburban settings, but city people are kind of shut out of it, right? You could do all this in this park. And the, re the replacement park, the Thomas Balsley um, Associates replacement park is actually quite nice, but it, you can see it's, it's a different place now, right? Someone said this, is a, this, is, this park was made for Instagram, for Instagram pictures, right? right so so we, we've done a good thing, but you know, here's, here's the site. This is, this is around the same, this is like the, from similar. We're looking at the same thing here. Right. So we're, we're, it's a big trade-off. Right. So uh, just just give me two or three minutes here to, to kind of well, let's just consider these questions, right? Um, you know, thinking about the eight eight or nine things that we're supposed to focus on here for the competition, right? All these like fishable and swimmable and uh, connecting neighborhoods and so on. Well, here's here's the problem. I'm I'm showing you a lot of cool stuff, but it doesn't fit any of our formats for. Um, architecture and planning. They, it just doesn't. It's not really sustainable in the traditional sense. It's not uh, spatial equality. It's not making the water cleaner. It's not doing any of that, right? So how do we do this, right? You can't hang your saxophone up in a park on a tree, right? Somebody will say something, right? And, and where, where do architects and planners and landscape architects fit into this, right? What, what do we do? Just leave things and let them crumble, right? So uh, this is something I'm working on, and I'm working on with my students. I'm working on with you guys. This is part of the, the conversation. I do think there's a few things that we can think about in, in professional design practice. Um, one is uh, the importance of the water and connections to it. I think you saw that in those slides. Another one is creating space where there's, there's gonna be some ability of people to get dirty, to do things, a kind of garden-esque aspect to parks. We should always have that. And um, you know, we're, we're good at finishing things and building things and making sure it's a 100%, but 100% is not always the best thing. Sometimes it's good to be incomplete Right, Imper imperfection is good. If, 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 if things are perfect, then it's gonna have to be maintained to perfect standards. So you have an expensive equipment, then you have to have rules governing the expensive equipment. You don't want people messing up the expensive equipment, right? So that was the beauty of the site. It was incomplete. There was something there for people to go and do and complete themselves. We have to have a conversation about risk, about liability. It's not just, um, the, the people in this room, it's a society at large uh, issue, but everyone in this room is a part of this, and we can't just say, oh, well, insurance and liability won't let us do that. We have to be activists, we have to push the envelope, we have to find places within our projects to introduce transgressive elements. That's up to you guys, you can do it. Finally, and this is what I, I often try and teach my students, is uh, that, um, you know, we, we, the, the people who use these places are, are living in the moment, and, and sometimes we should do that too, right? We, the the future is not always better, you know, and li life is, uh, it's finite, and for a lot of people, we'll wait and wait and wait and wait for something that never comes, or when it comes, it's disappointing. So let's try and refocus our frame sometimes to the immediate future. What can we do next week? What can we do next month, tomorrow? What can we do in the next six months? What can we realize? What can we do together, right? Let's find those opportunities and exploit them and make the most out of them and enjoy them. I have found, I won't talk about that. It's the last. Socrates Sculpture Park, I found a place where it's been going on for 32 years. Anyway, um, about Baltimore, so it's mostly been about New York City and I didn't even show you my Buffalo slides. I cut those out two days ago. Um, I think you know uh, New York and Baltimore have a lot of similarities and a lot of differences, right? Obviously you don't, you don't have the, the investment and you don't have the density, right? So some of this stuff that I'm showing you is a product of density. People, there's tons of people in New York and they're all you know, trying to do something and they're very entrepreneurial, right? Uh, so Baltimore doesn't quite have that social landscape, but it has this kind of landscape of places that are kind of uh, decaying, forlorn, forgotten, hidden, and some of them are purely magical, like Ferry Bar Park, and uh, my colleague Fred Sharman turned me on to these parks around the Middle Branch, and I think there are opportunities to think about these places in Baltimore and maybe apply some of these ideas or concepts to them, and I'm a little 
concerned about what's going on in Port Covington, uh, all the parks and uh, port parks in Port Covington, and, and some of these issues are, make the what I'm talking about so kind of superseded, a kind of you know uh, public and private and that kind of a thing. And we can talk about that in the um, the Q and A. But um, I want to thank you again, and I want to uh, turn it over to Barbara. Thank you. Barbara Wilkes is both a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and the American Society of Landscape Architects. Her design career has spread over four decades, the first two here in Baltimore. Barbara founded W Architecture and Landscape Architecture in New York City in 1999 after earning her Master of Landscape Architecture degree at the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to this, she was a founding partner of Cho Wilkes here in Baltimore. Barbara's urban design and public and institutional projects consistently receive critical accolades and recognition. Baltimore is fortunate to be the site of many of these award-winning designs. Barbara was also the president of AIA Baltimore, not once but twice, I believe, is that right? Two years? Uh, and, and now she's back here to show us what she's been doing. Please welcome Barbara Wilkes. Thank you, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, after all, this is a place I've lived longer than anywhere else in my life. I've lived here 25 years and you know, I was really attracted to Baltimore, actually, because of a lot of things, you know, you were talking about when I first came here in the early 70s, it was quite a different place than it, than it is now. Um, but, you know, any site that we look at, these are some of the things we think about. Where, where, what are the things that are coming together? And, and to us, that's what makes things interesting, these kind of edges. So in Baltimore, the land and water, the coastal plain, the Piedmont, the fall line, these are all ecological, and then culturally, you know, you're between north and south, which um, obviously has t tons that we can't even begin to talk about uh, tonight. But um, so, but it's this betweenness, um, wh which if we can borrow from ecology, it's where one ecosystem meets another, which gives you this potential for greater diversity. And they call that in um, e ecology the edge effect. Um, so, I mean, ecologically, you have all these you know, each one of those little divided boxes are very individual places that on a seashore, it's, it's you know, just a, a few inches or feet in, in uh, height, and it makes for a different place for different kinds of species to inhabit. I mean, similarly, um, on coastal edges, people also inhabit places differently, you know, depending on where you are, again, over that same kind of topographic range. And we also saw some great examples of, you know, how people naturally find their niches in these different kinds of places. So um, I, I sort of see the, uh, I guess in the simplest way, the some of the issues we're facing today um, is to get, you know, we have this great cultural diversity now, but we've kind of lost a lot of the biodiversity. Um, and how can we bring them together uh, more so that we ha can have both and we can engage uh, both diverse species as well as um, uh, other people. So people and species, the edge effect, try to bring them together. And I thought, I'm, so I'm going to quickly have a very different, rather than one story, <laughs> I have a whole lot of stories, but they're all trying to make the same point. So, and they're arranged chronologically. So you can also see that um, my thinking and our thinking at the office has, has changed a little um, over time as well. Um, I want to start with 1980. The AIA Baltimore at that point was doing a competition about the harbor. And uh, this was our entry, which I think won um, some kind of award. Um, just to show you, so this was the Harbor Edge. And, you know, I'm not, it, 
this, I don't even have the whole presentation, but the, the basic idea is we were suggesting that some of it become a park so that you know, there'd be some kind of interface between buildings and the edge and the water and either basically you're expanding that, that layer. Of course, it, it didn't happen. I hope your competition um, uh, engages uh, great ideas that, that start impacting what, what will happen. I think the middle branch is a, a really interesting area um, to be thinking about. So our next project, 20 years later from that competition entry, um, was in Tide Point, um, which was the former Procter & Gamble. So again, we kind of like to think, well, okay, we're really part of, at one scale, the Chesapeake Bay. I mean, if you stand on that side and think, well, I'm by the Chesapeake Bay, you know, it doesn't really compute, but it is. Um, and you're also part of that industrial harbor, and then you're also part of the site at the site scale of which was the Procter & Gamble plant and, and those buildings. Um, so sort of this idea of here's the industrial landscape, post, uh, been abandoned for five years very much. Um, uh, it was private though, so it was all fenced off. It was very, there weren't really, I don't, I, we didn't see any people any of the times we were there. <laughs> so no culture had, had grown here. Um, um, but it's also part of the Chesapeake, that sort of tide water. Um, and that to me, the, you know, the character of the kind of water that you're on has a lot to do with how we think about sites. So, so this is the sort of attempt to bring together industrial and tide water. You know, it's that sort of floating landscape and then we're using the industrial concrete to make things like benches so you don't have benches in what used to be an industrial site. You know, how can we just sort of play with industrial things to, to try to make a place? Um, similarly, tank bases, leaving the tank bases, so you have this concrete of, the, of that and the old walls around them. We tried not to change. In fact, I didn't bring uh, some of the pictures where we actually did leave. You know, there are a lot of the old walls uh, still there. Now it looks a little different. I have been there recently, and at least the last time I was there, there was a um, football field over this. But <laughs> um, it, it used to be more or less concrete, and then we put the new landscape um, in kind of between the cracks, sort of trying to think how it might have happened. It's some of that wildness, is, I would not never call this wild, but um, that was part, part of the idea. Um, so, you're, so you get some different environments. Again, these are, I should go back. You know, it's, it's creating layers, different kinds of habitats for different kinds of things to happen, both for people and for, um, other species and that there's a little more green than there used to be for um, birds and probably some insects and some other things. And then we put on this wooden, um, <clears throat> the wooden uh, platform, uh, which actually is over a, um, a, a part of the way the, that land was made. I forget now, I have the name just dropped out of my head. But anyway, it's a special kind of uh, way that they build the, this part of the land. Um, so we used uh, this platform to mark that, even though you can't see it above. So, um, and then the experience of transitioning through those zones, from the concrete zone, through the plants, up to the, up to the boardwalk, you know, also becomes a special event. And then the little fog feature, which was just a foot wide, very inexpensive spray device, um, you know, allows people to sort of play on their own. And again, you see the layers, you see the person in the distance sitting by the edge. So these different zones kind of set up places for different activities to foster engagement. Um, so like I said, I'm, I'm gonna go very fast. You could a quick tour of 20 years of work. Um, so this is their next project really in uh, West Harlem Piers. Um, it was the most simple of edges. It was basically a bulkhead and a parking lot on one side and water on the other. I mean, that's it, nothing else. Um, this is what it used to look like. It was a very 
diverse and was the place where people could access the water. It was a cove, basically, between these sort of highlands on either side. Um, we were hired by the Economic Development Corporation to do a master plan for what to do with that parking lot. Um, they wanted to put a hotel on it at one point, right, that they had put it out for an RFP before they hired us, you know, all these other things. The community wanted a park. They had wanted a park for a long time. We worked with the community and basically we finally did a master plan where that was going to be a park. Um, that could be a whole nother story. But, uh, um, oh, but I do want to say about this, so this was our master plan drawings where we also made some piers um, at the end of 125th Street, which is that diagonal. And then by the time we actually started then implementing the park with the community, they said, oh, oh, now that we've actually focused on getting it as a park and look at your plan, we realize we want the end of 125th Street to be water view. We don't want anything in the way, no piers. So the piers have to go to the side. They wanted piers, but just not at the end of 125th Street. So this was then the new plan um, that we came up with, that um, the whole idea behind it, oh, wait, let me go back again. These little diagrams on the bottom is, you know, it's, it's not about the city sort of being the privileged thing and going out over the water on the grid. It's more about the forces of the water um, coming in and, and sort of creating a, the cove again. So um, if you think of these piers as sort of floating in, and this is sort of a, the Hudson's actually, at least on the edges, it's very wide. And it, it's a, uh, compared to some of the other water that are narrower in, in New York, it's a pretty gentle river. So we sort of imagined this pier kind of floating up against the edge and just kind of bobbing there. Um, and then it got attached with these walkways out to it, which line up with the streets. Um, we also had to close some of the streets, the area in yellow, you know, to get more space. It was a very narrow site, and uh, to, to be able... So this was not asked for by the community. We just said, well, I mean, if you really want this to be a gathering space, we've got to get you more space somehow, besides the piers. Uh, so we'll close the streets and, you know, be able to, again, claim some of that back for people and for bicycles. This is part of the trail along the edge. And, and all those diagonals then also just spatially help make it feel wider. And again, trying to blur like the piers, we made them come up on the land. So, you know, you, you really can't, um, you've sort of, this whole feeling of where's the land and where's the water, although we couldn't um, change the bulkhead. We, that was um, something we weren't allowed to do um, because, the, well, we, we could have done it, but to pull it back, you would have lost the whole site because you can't ever go into the water. You have to always pull back. So, um, so anyway, here you see the site expanding. And then you see it sort of ends in a cove-like space, which again has different kinds of seating for people doing different things. Um, scattered like they're left by waves, you know, people end up using them. These are the pictures you take that, you know, have the people as they're actually using it versus the photographer. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they hang out on all the, the seats and then the not seats, and it's kind of fun. And then kids, we have just some little simple water things because water is important and it attracts people and they do want to interact with it. And since you can't really interact with the river here. Um, and then... I also should say kids like walking around. They find little things to do, which I also always find interesting. Like they walk around the edges of this concrete. I never managed to snap a kid doing that because I'm always embarrassed to get on right and while they're doing it. But, but I did get these kids. They also, because this has so many loops, which is circulation is also really important to us. And so the kids sort of find these things and play with them. And so we always make a lot of loops in our plans because um, you know, it just makes it more interesting, and it also adds to all these layers. So, like, normally, the rest of this, if you go south from here, there's just a path through a lawn, because really, that's all the wider it is. For You know, normally, that's what they do, but, you know, we have, like, three paths in the same amount of space, so there's, you feel like there's a lot more space there, um, even though there really isn't. And then we also added um, some trees. Um, Trees are really important. I mean, uh, I don't, I'm trying to go through all these, but so 
we only added 110 trees. Um, doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, it's a, it's a, will help, and it does make. And they have grown more now than this. We also have some art for, um, from Neri Ward, who's a um, very good local artist, but also an internationally known artist. Um, and then you also see more of these edges, creating more edges, you know, to allow the bikers and people using it in different ways. And I would say that we did put this crunchy material here and kids do dig in it. So <laughs> um, there is digging and it seems to be tolerated. Um, uh, and some old uh, pieces uh, from the bulkhead when we put in the new piers. Um, and here again, the edge, I'm just trying to make the point of like how many different places you can get even in such a small site that allow people to to use the site in different ways, including the fishermen that were the only people that were using the parking lot because <laughs> they did come and sit at the edge of it and fish. So they're still there. Um, yeah, collaborating with the artists, this is more of an overview. And then that's, that's really an overview. Now the one thing though, um, and again, I'm, I'm a fan of wildness, is you know, even though we added 110 trees and the site's 60% more permeable and you know, it's doing all these other great things, it's still always gonna have to be maintained. Um, you know, it's, it's, that's just the way it's built. You know, it's park standards, we had to do this. We, we had to argue to get the, the decomposed granite, you know, they probably wouldn't let us use that anymore just because we had EDC as our client, we managed to do that. Um, but, you know, it, there are really no um, systems that are operating on their own, except for one. We did also put in some reef balls in the, in the river, and um, they've been down there now since 2006, and there's a, the, a guy that kind of watches over this site, and he keeps sending me these um, Instagram, you know, these photos uh, on my email, and so he's he's now um, um, documenting that there's oysters um, actually growing on this, and I'm sure there's a lot more fish too, because the fishermen are are very happy. Um, so you know, there is part of, and we, you know, no one has touched this for now at least more than ten years. Um, so it's a totally different kind of um, environment. You know, it is a, a wild, you know, we, we seeded it, but now it's just going on on its own. Uh, so keep that in mind. I'm going to come back to that little by little as we proceed. Um, okay, so this is the site that is the one uh, just south of the site we just learned a lot about. Um, so where he was talking about was, oh, sorry. I'm looking at the next slide, not this one. <laughs> this shows me too, sorry. Okay, so you see it has these wonderful views of Manhattan. You see it's on the edge where there's these bigger lots and all the little lots behind it, you know, that have the finer grain of the residential and these big lots were the industrial areas, as we heard a lot about. Um, so, and there's that breather at the top of the page. So most of the photographs you were seeing, you know, were to the north of this, which is the state park. Um, I guess this is, I didn't know that, but I guess this is part that somebody bought and then sold later to my client or whatever. Um, uh, and we started working on this in, right after we finished West Harlem, they sort of said, oh, we like what you did there, you know, why don't you come over and talk to us? So, um, uh, so here, again, we're, uh, this, is, this is the East River, which is actually a tidal strait, and the water moves through four times a day, back and forth, like very, it's pretty violent, uh, pretty quick, except right when it's stopped between, you know, moving, then it, that's when historically everybody used to go swimming, uh, between the shifting tides. But anyway, so we, our uh, design sort of, tosses the piers, you know, further inland, and, you know, there's a lot more crunching and stuff going on that, that, that is the forces of the water, again, pushing into the site. And then you have the, the red, the force of the city. There is uh, one pier, so we pedestrianized the streets, and the pier goes out, and you actually can go down and stand over the water. Again, this part doesn't have that beach that um, was shown. That's further up. And again, making these layers. This is all the pictures I have. We have now finished it, but it's not open to the public, so I don't have pictures of the phase two, which has the long piers. This is the phase one. 
and it's where the phase two is where they were that smorgasbord and or Brooklyn flea picture was. So it's just to the uh, right off the page. Um, so anyway, these are the different layers. And as you notice, as you get away from the building, so there's actually a parking lot under underneath part of it. Um, it's, most people, you can't really tell at all, but it does change the ecology. And what we tried to do, um, and it's actually working, there's some volunteer trees and stuff coming up in the edge, is that the part uh, you know, where the lawns are and then uh, the planter that's between the buildings and the park is, is maintained more like a park. The, the part by the edge is a lot less maintained. Some of that's accidental because the parks department just doesn't do that great of a job. <laughs> but um, it, it, it's also, you know, it, it, the way it's built allows that to happen, and we're happy about it. And, you know, you can, so people sit and find different places, and some are more alone, and some are more together. You know, you can, you can have, you can't dig, I don't think. There are lots of dogs, though. Dogs are allowed everywhere because they're in the buildings, and um, they, in fact, are, there's so many dogs, it's quite a problem, actually, at this site in terms of um, they're just running everywhere all the time, constantly. <clears throat> Again, we're playing up the views. Oh, I didn't mention that strange angle of the pier coming in points you right at the Empire State Building, so it, in case you missed, the, you have a wonderful view of that. And, you know, here you see what it looks like on one of those kind of days. Um, it's also crowded all the time uh, when the weather's nice and the people from the ferries uh, come up and um, you know, go through the site as well. So, oh, so this street is one of those streets that we pedestrianized. It used to be a very derelict looking street. We graded it down more into the water and it started us thinking about all these dead end streets, um, which you see one in the picture here and, and how if they go to the water and they don't go anywhere else, why don't we just let them go down and you know, become you know, let the water come in a little, let them become sort of like a wetland. We could start um, recreating these. So we actually put out a, a, a book, a little article called Marine Streets, so trying to get the city to, to take this on, but that, that didn't uh, catch. Um, and then we also did an exhibit. Um, we were asked to be in an exhibit considering, um, I guess it was the, well, it was five architects from Amsterdam and five from New York, and we were assigned recreation. So what could we do with recreation to think about what the future might be like in New York? So we said this idea of wetlands and also the idea of dredging, maybe you could build some islands since we're not really gonna change where the buildings are and we can't cut into the land and make wetlands. Maybe we can add some of the dredge on the outside, make some little places that could become wetlands, but they could also be, um, places to give refuge both to animals but also to people if, so that actually they could get out on the water and not feel again so unsafe in this really, really wide river that there'd be some places of refuge that you could even just paddle around in or you could go from one to the other uh, and, and feel a little, all the way up to Troy because uh, all the way up to Troy is a title, the Hudson's title. Um, okay. So now moving on to a bigger park, not just sort of these little slivers by the water. This is a whole island in Calgary, um, which they wanted, um, <laughs> could have done a study here as well, that they're redoing this East Village. It was a rail yard. And St. Patrick's Island um, has, is basically, uh, I guess, yeah, more not 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 that used. Uh, it's used by homeless and people that uh, margin. It's a marginal space. This is what it looked like when when we started there. This is where the Occupy was happening, and so the Occupy people were here. Um, that's what this these uh, were about. And then, but you also ecologically also it's been made into. It's not like an island, it's really more like a park with lawn and trees, like so many parks that we know, and the water is really not allowed to interact with the landscape at all. Um, so our scheme for 
restoring the island was to actually let the water cut into the island again, like it had in the past. And then when we had some, so we build two new, two new streams. And then with the soil that we dug up, we made a hill. So there's more things for people to do um, because there's more places. So here's the new plan um, with the two new, I'll go into it a quick and a little more um, close up. And we again have lots of loops. Uh, this is um, 25 acres, lots of loops for people to walk in. Although there's some areas that we won't allow you to walk in. You can go in if you want, but there's no paths. And that's because the ecology is more intact and, and we really don't want it to be disturbed on a regular basis. Um, so this is one of the streams we put in to allow people to actually touch the water. So we call it the seasonal breach. You can see it here as it actually was built and you can also see the hill. But again, it used to be a lawn. This was before, I know it's hard to tell it's a lawn, but um, oops, wait, what did I do? Okay, sorry, I pressed the wrong thing. So you can use it in the winter for ice skating. That's a rendering. These are the renderings we showed there and there it is as the breach. But here it is as the real thing where people can come, the water changes, you know, it can be higher or lower or, you know, whatever's happening with the river. Um, uh, we also made this beach. Uh, it has different layers. Again, this is the photographer shot during a normal day. It would be packed, but different activities would be happening, you know, on the lawn that would be happening on the seat walls that would be happening down at the water. So you kind of get these kind of different places that people um, can do things. And this is a, a bridge that goes over that new channel, and it has, again, little places where you can go off and um, do stuff. And, and here's our, the, the hill as we build it, the rise is the, the official name, which gives you a great view of the harbor. Also, again, kids, you know, there's, we put this little white edge to change the grading, and again, it's just sort of a fun thing that kids have discovered to, to run around on. Of course, big things can happen there, like movies and programmed events, as well as you know, kids just rolling down it and sledding. And here's some people. There's a fire pit at the top. Some people that in the winter time had taken that over to make a fire and use it. Um, so, um, and then this is the second stream that we added. Um, it's called, it's just a wetland. You're really not supposed to go in it. It's more of a habitat. Um, it has this big uh, plaza though at the end where there, the zoo is right across from this and there was an existing parking lot. So we um, b built that in together. Here's the wetland right after it was built. It hadn't grown in too much yet, but some picnic tables, a place where you can walk across it place where you can get out at the end and look over the water, the plaza. Um, and again, this is uh, in the not fancy pictures gets, you know, tons of use there. In the wintertime, they even play, what's it called? That, that uh, one where you use the brooms, they, they do that there. <laughs> right, it's really pretty funny. Um, here you see the green of the wetland, uh, uh, it, as, as you walk down and, and see it. And then there's a nice deck where you can sit and, and watch over it. And here's more of the plaza. You can, yeah, I think you can see we took a lot of care in keeping the old trees and changing the topography in order to do that. We also made this, uh, the little building that's the restrooms and the maintenance is covered with wood that was taken off of an old bridge, uh, an old pedestrian bridge that was removed. Uh, the, the bridge was actually a separate competition that some a French, sculpt, uh, French structural engineer won. But so anyway, we saved the wood from the old one and, and made it this building. And that's where you can learn about the ecology. And this is a pavilion. I'm trying to keep in time. I've gotten a signal here. Um, so. Um, you know, but I guess what I would say about this is I think we, we were actually successful in this project in keeping some actual wild areas. I mean, the whole island can now flood, um, and it will flood. Um, and what, so it's really a, more of an, a natural landscape with some ma maintained places within it, which I was 
you know, kind of happy to have been able to do. Felt like this was a, a step forward. Um, I'm going to go, I'm not even going to show this one. This was one we just finished in Tampa, but it, it doesn't really fit with that story because there's really no, um, it's got some edges, but um, so we won't talk about this one. We even did a building here, but we won't. But I would like to talk about um, this one in St. Petersburg. It invited, it's a competition, so it's not going to happen. But they wanted to know what to do with this pier. Um, and... Um, and, and we said, well, you know, actually these piers, they get rebuilt all the time. They had a very strict budget. You wanted to build, the, see that pyramid? That's what was out there. And they, actually, we had to say at the beginning if we were going to build a new building or save the pyramid. And, and we said, we're going to save the pyramid. Those were your two choices. Um, and then we got into it, and budget was very important because they had fired the last architect because he was over budget. And we said, well, you know, actually, you can't afford that building. And... It's also the wrong thing to do. What you really should do is build a landscape. You need to build a lagoon in this space that's right now all lawn and trees. And the lagoon will be the, the attractor. You don't need a building way out at the end with a private restaurant in it you know, to be the attractor. You should have a, a lagoon, a landscape that people can go in because yeah, all your other parks are lawns and trees, something a little more wild. <laughs> so there is a theme. Um, and it also spreads out your events. Right now you have an event back at the city and you have this event at the end and you have some parking in the middle and you know that's not very pleasing. So you need to spread out the events and get people to move around. You know, so we we said you should do this lagoon. And you know, a lot of, there is a, a, a lot of, we got a lot of comments about what about mosquitoes, well, won't it you know, attract you know, all kinds of stuff. So um, you know, we were eliminated, <laughs> long story short. But to me, it's an important project. And you know, I, I'm still very proud of it. And in fact, good news is they actually then realized, OK, they hired somebody to do the building out at the end of the pier, but they didn't have anything in the middle in that space where we're proposing the lagoon to attach the pier to the city. So they actually hired us to do that job. They found some more money. They wouldn't let us do the lagoon though, but we, you know, we did get some work. So these are all the pier, what we did on the pier. And then there's one more I wanna show you because it's in a similar theme. We recently um, competed in, these again are sort of chronological. We recently complete, uh, competed in St. Louis, this thing called the Choteau Greenway. We did another competition. And um, they basically wanted you to connect the park to the arch, the park being uh, Forest Park and the arch being, you know, the gateway to the west on the river. And after meeting with the community and doing some other things, our first comment was, well, actually, you have four parks. You've sort of forgotten. There's two other parks and, and different kinds of communities live, you know, to the north and the south, and they want to be connected too. So this was our first um, comment back to them. And, and then we also said, you know, you actually have a void. This is an actual drawing of where people live in St. Louis. Um, and you can see that like nobody lives downtown. Um, and in fact, it, this is what it used to be. And well, this is the, still the topography. Um, but it actually used to have water in it. <laughs> it used to be a place. It, they turned it into where they put their highway, they put their rail, and they put their parking lots. And then they put bridges over it so that you never have to go down there unless you're on one of those systems. Um, so we said, okay, well, let's, let's put in, uh, number one, a street that actually does connect the... Uh, the, you know, so you can have a formal street connecting the park to the arch. But we also want this thing called the Valley Bee Line, which would be through these new ecologies and new places that we're going to make in the valley um, and bring back and also help solve some of your stormwater management problem. They have the biggest uh, consent decree um, cost in the whole country of what they have to do for their storm. They're, and then what they're doing is they're building huge tunnels to store water instead of doing anything that you know you would I, might actually get some amenity out of, so so we propose that they make a big 
big lake and that they make some wetlands and that they sort of make parks around all these things and that that would be the Valley Bee Line that would connect these two parks. And then they needed some north-south connections to connect the, the north and south parks so they could really bring their city together. So the Valley Bee Line, again, I think, um, you know, I, what, you can see the before pictures, how it's just all concrete and, and what we wanted it to be on, on all of these. Notice it's a huge, par I mean, these are huge parking lots. Um, um, and w this is where we put the lake. Um, then they also, like all the space underneath the highway, you know, was totally not being used, if you can see the before picture, and how that would, the highway that tore down the African American community that was in this location called Mill Valley, you know, could actually become sort of the new pathway that would tie everything together. Um, so, and we called it Turpin's Porch after one of the families that, um, that lived, uh, that was one of the prominent families that lived in that area. Um, basketball also under this highway, again now in very um, desolate part, connect to the light rail. Right now you have to take elevators down from these big bridges to, to, to the light rail, it's very inconvenient. Um, and this is a, a connector where the highway uh, cuts through. So, um, transform boundaries into engageable edges, uh, make connections to people and other species, make diverse and resilient habitats, and create a vital, sustainable world. Hopefully, I'm not too far over. <laughs> My name is Eric Shore. I'm on the uh, lecture series committee. And I'd like to thank again both of our esteemed speakers for sharing their knowledge and their experiences. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and we'd like now to open it up to all of you for uh, questions for the guests. Um, yeah. Oh, and I'll also I'll add in, um, please wait for the microphone to get to you just so we can be sure we hear your question. Anybody? Oh. Uh, Close on. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say the governance and maintenance are, are both like really big issues. Um, and, but, but the problem with that is that, like you just said, it's private and, um, you know, that can lead to other kinds of issues. I mean, like, you know, that, that certain people might not be allowed to come or, I mean, at, at least in, I mean, I think New York uh, tries, I mean, we could have a little argument about this to, to, the public spaces are are public, and you know that's a good thing about them. So, but I'd love to, you know, to come up with some answer. Yeah. 
governance is a huge problem. I, I agree with you that um, uh, that there's in these places, these sort of in between spaces, there's a that the social diversity also there's also ecological diversity. And my my uh, artist colleagues who are now taking this research with the next epoch uh, seed library to a PhD level um, research um, are are documenting that there is real biological diversity in these spaces. Not, it's non-native though, so there has to be a kind of a, a change in how we view native versus non-native. But I, I think your, your larger point is a great one, and I think in Barbara's presentation, you know, you heard all of the kind of pushing the edge ideas that her firm had always ran into a, a kind of a, a brick wall uh, or some kind of somebody who said no. And I think, you know, this is a kind of iterative, case by case, we've got to work on it kind of problem. Mm -hmm. um, we have to put, but we have to push back on it. We can't just accept the status quo. I, I think there's a feeling now that places should be a little messy, and the Adventure Playground is a great example of that kind of design. And my argument, and I, I talk about it in the Accidental Playground, I, I say, you know, we should have adventure playgrounds for adults, right? So uh, maybe not exactly the same elements, but something that uh, everyone has to play. You know, everyone has this kind of biological need to be in touch with nature, in touch with the elements. And somehow we've got to find that. And I think when we do find it, we'll also have the the, bi the rich biological diversity as well. Yeah, I, I, one thing I was going to say and, and then I forgot is we do very little program areas in, in our parks and, and that's, I mean, we'll, we'll do them obviously if somebody asks us to do them and we had to go to some playgrounds and some of these, but, but I think part of our idea and you know, I'd, I'd love to, you know, I'm going to read your book and see if I can figure out ways to make it more successful, but that to let people find their own things to do, you know, by making all these different places and different ways you can come at it. And, and, ch and you know, I'm not against change. I think change uh, would be good. Then if we, um, but let people discover for themselves. And that's part of the reason we... We, we also try to have the forces of the place kind of be part of the design so that it kind of helps with the discovery process and maybe somebody would be think about it, you know, because one thing I find is people think landscapes just are there. You know, they don't really think about them. And I think something that gets you to think about them a little bit and engage with them hopefully starts you on, on some kind of path. Because there are a lot of people that wouldn't go to those places, right? Absolutely true. <laughs> but by the same token, not everyone is comfortable in in the organized park, right? You know, even in a place like Times Square, people will say, "Well, I, that's not for me," right? So, it's hard. We have to also kind of get beyond like this universal ideal of we can design a park for everyone, right? You know, I, I, I like the idea of kind of the ad hoc park, but I just wanted to try to understand the context. You know, you got the Brooklyn Bridge Park, you've got Dumbo, and then you've got this thing here, whatever, and, and how do they interrelate? And I, I kind of like the idea because it gives you three different approaches to addressing the waterfront. Well, if you just showed up in New York, um, uh, you know, say yesterday, <laughs> And you went to these parks, you say, wow, oh my God, you know, the, I mean, none of, these, none of these parks existed 20 years ago, right? And this area in North Brooklyn was, I, 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 maybe I didn't say it, like this was a, a, an area of Brooklyn that's surrounded by water on three sides, but there was no place that you could actually get to the water. In most places, you couldn't even see it, right? So there's this, this real, we, we, we've, we've grown by leaps and bounds in, some con in a lot of conventional ways and some unconventional ways as well. And uh, all of the collective stakeholders of the city need to get credit for that. Um, the, 
these parks are all kind of different. So there's, what, what I showed you was the state park, and then what Barbara worked on was a developer-funded city esplanade, and then um, Brooklyn Bridge Park is a city park that has its own uh, operating corporation that, uh, it started as a state park, but it was handed off to the, the city. And there's a, it, it's a kind of quasi-governmental agency that manages it, kind of like the IRS, yeah. right? Yeah. So they all, they all have a kind of different set of operating procedures. Yeah. yeah, my park's managed by the parks department. And so we had to meet with all those needs. So it's, yeah, all, maintenance and governance are definitely the, the two key things. And, and, and I don't know that we ever actually said that that whole Williamsburg um, green point is what they call it. It's a zoning. They, you know, they. I guess you did say they rezoned that whole area. So that's why the developers were allowed to put the tall buildings, but in exchange they had to build all the public space and and have it. It's it's public public space, not not at all private. And there's a, a above the state park now. There's another city park which was also part of the the zoning, the agree it's not in the zoning, but it was part of the agreement that got that zoning passed in 2005. Um, so it is kind of complicated and they all operate under different rules. Uh, it would be better, and I argued even from a very conventional standpoint in, in the accidental playground, that all of these spaces should be under one kind of managing entity rather than you know this sort of flip-flop, flip-flop as you go from south to north. It's better. You get more. Diversity. Maybe it is. <laughs> maybe and maybe there it creates more kind of cracks for things to evolve and grow. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks for the shout out, Dan. I didn't expect to see <laughs> me in the distance in a silhouette in one of your photos, but I, I really love the two presentations together, uh, especially Barbara. And the, it seems like the way so many of the activities that, uh, that Dan describes show up in different ways in your spaces, which is just wonderful to, to see. And it makes me, and I've been thinking about spaces like this for a long time and talking with, with different people like Dan about them, it makes me think that like this romanticism we have about accidental playgrounds is like, oh, designers can never, or how do we design this? And it, maybe it's the case that designers can never really make these spaces that produce these activities, but we can then use them and think about how they, how they work and incorporate them into design spaces. Um, but, but what I wanted to ask was like, maybe these, are, these, are, these spaces are still happening elsewhere and these activities are happening elsewhere, not even in Greenpoint, but somewhere else in New York City envir or environs and somewhere else in Baltimore environs. Where do you think they might be? Where do you think we should look for um, these unplanned but productive activities today in Baltimore or New York? any vacant lot. <laughs> well, they, they're, you know, I was, I was kind of jaded after I did all the research. I thought, oh, well, this is it. This is the last big waterfront space. Uh, the, the frontier is closing. You know, the Wild West is over. But then, you know, there was the site in, uh, in Hunter's Point, right? And uh, that was a little less accessible. It was less, at that time, there was less people living right on the, the edge of it. It's all changing and evolving now. Um, you know, there's 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 always going to be some place because these places are all aging, and you know, you add thirty or forty years, and some of these spaces will decay, and Shopping and malls. we'll we'll <laughs> get you know we'll get the next iteration right. But before we get the next iteration, there'll be a lull, and that will allow potentially insurgent actors to um, to infiltrate right. Um, also, there's a lot of if you go to the Bronx. The Bronx has a lot of shoreline. New York City's got 500 miles of shoreline, right? So there are places in the Bronx and places in Staten Island that have not been discovered or colonized yet, and, and they, they retain this kind of quality to them. Um, it's different now. I mean, it, it, you, we can't go back to 2000 and we can't go back to 1980, right? Like, things keep evolving. So the, the same idea today is, is something different on the ground. But they're there, and some of these activities, this was a, a, a point that someone at Penn made to me, a, a professor. He said, well, 
you know, if you shut these spaces down, what happens to the people, right? What, what, what do they, do they stop doing it, right? All of the different protagonists that I showed you found other places to do their art, whatever it is. But what we lost was that kind of dialogue between them and the dialogue of them doing it in that space uh, with the rest of the city. That's what kind of made it special. Yeah, and who was, there was the art, I mean, before Williamsburg, there was the, the Manhattan, yeah. the, you know. Art on the beach. Where were they cut the big holes that, I can't remember his name right Gordon now. Gordon Mata Clark. Yeah, Gordon Mata Clark, and you know, all those people. Day's End. Were over there, so. Uh, uh, anywhere, I mean, this is the thing about the waterfront, is that we, we we've been told that, you know, uh, this is all new that that for you know a century or century and a half in urban places that this was solely the province of industry and 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 now we've been invited back right this is a this is a narrative uh, but that's not really true there's always been these kinds of outsider activities in the waterfront whether you go back 20 years or 120 years you find a kind of incredible diversity, right? The, the waterfront was a, always a place of dreamers and schemers and people arriving from foreign lands and goods and a kind of romanticism as well, right? So, the, and, and recreation has always happened kind of in between these places, all of New York City's recreation piers that existed in these floating pools. New York has this incredible history of that as well. And, uh, versions of this happen in Baltimore and in Philadelphia and in Boston as well. I'd like to ask you, though, a question. What do you think, I like Klaus's way of putting it, about the social wilderness and the natural wilderness? Um, I mean, I guess part of, and I guess in the back of my mind, if I really you know, think about what I'm thinking about, is, like you said, Walden. I mean, that having the natural wilderness sort of gives in a way, like a permission or, you know, something to enter for, for people. Um, so, I mean, do you see any connection between these two things? Between the natural and the post-industrial? Yeah, I mean, a, a place for thinking about wilding in terms of, you know, what about the other animals and everything, too? I mean, Absolutely, <laughs> right? This is, a, this is that kind of place. And I always thought when I was doing, I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to be flip about it. I, I, I genuinely think this. I, while I was doing that research in Brooklyn, I thought I've got to find a, a bird expert, you know, and who, who will tell me how important this, this site is for, you know, the kind of flyover, right, the migration. And I never, I never did that. I never quite got to that. I did find the industrial archaeologists, and I took them to the site, and they told me this, they told me that. They didn't actually tell me anything I didn't know. But I didn't get the birders, you know. So um, I think these connections exist. And maybe some of the answer might be to, at a kind of higher level, to pick and choose places that we'll, where we're going to focus our resources and capital on. We, we make strategic choices. So maybe, maybe some of these places can just stay as they are for another five years or 10 years or 20 years and we take the very precious capital we have and make a conscious decision to put them in other places where you don't have this kind of environment it's it's fraught with you know issues uh, it's not a it's not a solution to anything but it's an idea yeah i think the maintenance is key because people have such a fix especially in the united states you know, lawn and trees as a park, and that's it. And if you do something else, they say it looks messy. And just if we can somehow get that message changed, you know, that should be <laughs> like what we really try for for the next, you know, 10 years. That would make a world of difference. I think there was one more question in the back. Hello, um, my name is Rahma Davis. I'm from Morgan State University. And my question is, um, we have this desire to go closer to the edge. And does our desire to go closer to the water neg negatively affect the ecosystem? And if so, what materials can we use to sustainably build um, 
near the water so we don't disrupt the ecosystem. What? I mean, a beach, you're not really hurting. The, I mean, uh, you know, again, it's all a matter of proportion. If there's a thousand people treading the beach, const you know, and the whole place is constantly filled, I mean, that's one thing. But, you know, if people walking, I mean, that's a material that can take, um, you know, people walking on it. Um, so, no, it, I, I mean, if you, on the other hand, go in a place that's all grown and it's holding the, the, the side of the edge and, and you trample down all the, you know, repeatedly trample down all the, you know, then it will be a problem. So it's, you know, it's also some kind of awareness on people's part to, you know, be, I, and I, which I think people used to have, you know, become much more aware of what you're doing and how you do impact the en environment. And you can learn that by, by doing it. So. Um, yeah, one up. I'm Ruth from Morgan State. My question is going back to Baltimore, if maybe each of you could make a brief comment. One thing was said, Baltimore doesn't have the density of people that Brooklyn has, you know, flooding to the waterfront with all of the diverse activities. We have a, a smaller population. So the question is, how is Baltimore different both in terms of good potential and in terms of tough challenges? Well, I haven't been here as much recently, but I, I do remember when I first came here in the 70s, and they, Baltimore did a very smart thing, which was in the Inner Harbor, all they put in at first was just a pathway. You know, so it really just said, you're invited to come down here, but there, there's nothing else. It was a little like that park. And, you know, and it was, I mean, because obviously funding has a lot to do with all the stuff we're talking about, too. That's why they have developers paying for public parks and things like that. So I think having ways to uh, make people know they're invited so that they do come down to the water um, is, is good. You know, again, I don't know how that applies to some of the other areas now, but you do have some good history. I think there, there's tremendous potential in Baltimore. So the, the global capital that's flooded New York and so many other you know, kind of top tier cities, whether you're talking about Hong Kong or uh, you know, Miami or, or London, um, it hasn't quite happened here yet. So the, we don't have to catch up to the demand, right? We can kind of rethink what we're doing before it happens. And uh, Baltimore is like New York in the sense that it has all these peninsulas and, and the, the waterfront itself is incredibly intricate, right? It's, it's, uh, there's a kind of interesting place always just around the corner. So I do think, you know, if, if the city doesn't keep giving away big chunks of its waterfront, that we can have this kind of collective rethink about how we treat the water's edge and what we want to be there. And we can kind of think out of the box. In New York, it's almost, I don't want to say it's too late, but there is just so much pressure, right? Well, I will say, let me also go back, because when I was here in Baltimore, Baltimore was way ahead. Um, but on the other hand, then, they never really created a public walk, uh, maybe they've got it now, but the, the creation of the public walkway all around was because so much of it was in private property of the waterfront, whereas in New York, they've actually managed to, in, to, to mandate that private owners put a public edge now, and it becomes public. It's not just an easement or anything. So I think, I think Baltimore could learn from New York in terms of making sure the waterfront is public and not private. Certainly, we could use that at Fort Covington, right? So we have one front and center here, and then another one uh, back there. Secondly, let's grab her first.
to we allowed the demolition of it and there's nothing to replace it. Uh, we removed the iconic uh, 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 Johansson building there at the corner, uh, you know, without uh, uh, something replacing it. We allowed Haiti to develop the Allied chemical site, a perfect site for uh, the development of something as an introduction to the city of Buffalo. No. Thanks, Leon. Well said. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, now we'll come down to the front right here. Leon, you thought I didn't see you. I saw you. <laughs> Thank you for that, Leon. Samia um, from Morgan State University. Really enjoyed both the presentations, have read the book, enjoyed that as well. It's really interesting because this whole uh, notion of the waterfront, the way we call it, um, front assumes a back. Um, and I think that that's probably the problem with the waterfronts, that it's all of a sudden wants to become the front of the city from being the back of the city. Uh, at least in the Western context, not all waterfronts across the world were industrial. Some uh, were trade centers and still fishing villages when the uh, virus of waterfront redevelopment from Baltimore was uh, internationally exported from US. So I think this uh, whole idea of the waterfront has to be reimagined because wherever there is ocean, there is some water from the land coming in. And there's a wonderful word in Arabic and a place in Dubai called Rubaiba. And it's coming from the word Ghayab, which is disappearing. So Rubaiba is really the disappearing land, which means that the land is underneath there. Land continues. Just the tidal waters go up and down based on where the water is coming from and from the mountains and how it meets the water. So I don't know. This uh, Maybe we need to change the lexical and uh, not call it an edge, but something that is... Uh, um, continuation of land, and co similarly continuation of water on land. I think, I think Barbara's project with the street ends and letting the water on kind of gets at that, right? The, you know, re-naturalizing in a, in a very urban setting. Like, that would be great to walk down uh, Ken Avenue there in Williamsburg and look, see the, the water kind of washing up. Bringing us back to some, something that's more maybe universal about the waterfront rather than this kind of industrial vision, right? Yes, American centric, definitely. All right, well, I think we're going to have to cut it there. Um, we're all, all going to be going over to the brass tap afterwards, and we invite everyone to join us. Um, and there will be more copies of Dan's book there, and maybe you can get him to sign it as well. But before we head over, please, one more thank you to the speakers.